Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we're going to talk about the practice of meditation and how it can help with stress relief as well as for self-improvement purposes. My guest today is Megan McRae. Ms. McRae is a wellness consultant and she is also the Chief Culture Officer for a local law firm. Welcome, Megan, and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Thank you for having me. I described you as a chief culture officer for a law firm. What exactly is that and what do you do? Okay, it's a relatively new title that's come up, the CCO position or a new officer position. I focus on the culture of the company. I bring in meditation, I'll bring in different wellness offerings, and I also act as a liaison between the staff, the lawyers, and the owner focusing on communication, um, clarifying, like reducing the drama, the gossip, and hopefully increasing a positive work environment overall. Well, our topic today, of course, is meditation. And I know that you gravitated toward meditation yourself mm -hmm. because of what you told me in an earlier conversation was a very active mind. Yes. And with an active mind comes a lot of thoughts uh, coming in all the time. And I think you told me that you wanted to find a way to calm down some of the anxiety and some of the hyper concerns that uh, develop as a result of that active mind. So how did you find meditation and why did you pursue it? Well, gosh, you know, growing up, I always had a little bit of anxiety, nothing diagnosed, just very that, as you put it, an active mind. And when I was in college, I had quit playing volleyball. I was an athlete for years. That was my where my focus went, was being an athlete, working out every day. So when I lost that, I kind of lost my identity and I didn't know what to do. Felt a little bit depressed, anxiety went up, and I ended up coming into yoga and meditation. And I felt this sense of peace, um, a sense of relief and comfort that I hadn't felt in a really long time. And so that feeling is what, it was the catalyst for me eventually becoming a teacher and teaching people about meditation presently. Let's talk about the core elements of meditation okay. and why it allows people to find that sense of calmness. Some call it inner peace. Some refer to it as relief of stress, that sort of thing. So what are the core aspects of meditation that allow people to find those areas of uh, inner peace? Let me kind of clarify for a moment. I'm going to start with just educating the audience on what the main definition of meditation, what that is. So it's not about reaching some state of enlightenment or quieting your mind immediately. It's a practice and a training to train your mind to focus on one thing. So in meditation, you can have many different focal points. I can focus on a candle flame. I can focus on an affirmation or my breath or um, the plants. I can do moving meditations while I'm walking. I can kind of focus on nature, anything that's in this present moment. Now, meditation doesn't mean when I'm practicing that I'm all of a sudden going to feel a sense of peace over time of practicing every day, we'll see more and more results. It has positive impacts on the brain. It has positive impacts emotionally, physically, on all levels. But it really is a training and it doesn't have like kind of these magical results all at once, though some people may experience amazing results right away. Well, is meditation good for everyone? In other words, are certain yes. personalities more suited for it than others. Nope. Okay. And what about doing meditation as a regular practice versus on an as needed basis? I love that question because it's something I share with my clients. Um, any sort of skill that we're building, be it meditation or a language or an instrument, anything requires daily practice. So I would rather someone do a short meditation to start every single day than one long meditation once a week. We're gonna derive more benefit. So though I think um, there are practices like TM who require 20 minutes twice a day. Um, while that's an excellent goal, and ideally we'd like to be meditating that long, for some of us who may not be ready to put in that discipline and that commitment, start with three minutes. 
Try it out. See if you can accomplish that little goal and achieve it every day. And then maybe um, one day you end up doing 10 minutes instead of three. So it's creating um, reasonable goals. That's my philosophy. And then making sure you have a daily practice and commitment. And over time, that time length usually increases and it feels easier and easier and the benefits continue to go up. We're going to talk about transcendental meditation a bit more in a moment uh, because it is trademarked as TM. Mm -hmm. But before we get to that, I want to talk more about the environment that one needs in order to engage um, most effectively in meditation. You brought that up earlier and I like that. So one thing, I, and we were discussing, does someone need to turn off the television? Do you have to shut out all sound to meditate? You really don't have to change your environment if you can't because we may be in a place where we can't help but hear the cars driving by or someone snoring or who knows what's going on around us. When I start off with a very beginner who's never med meditated before, I'll kind of get them in an appropriate position. So it, you can meditate standing up, lying down, sitting, and ideally if I can control my environment, I will turn off the TV and I will shut off as much sound as I can because the quieter it is, the easier it is for our mind to focus on one thing or right here in the moment. If I can't, what I'll say is, hey, if you notice those cars zooming by, or you notice that big bang or whatever it may be, maybe it's an emotional something that keeps bringing us back to the past, notice it. There's no need to push it away. So if I'm sitting there trying to meditate and I'm trying to quiet my mind, yet I can't help but hear all these other noises and I can't help but feel these emotions coming up within me, I'm gonna create more stress and more resistance, and that's gonna defeat the purpose of meditation, which is to release that, to come into a state of more acceptance, more peace, and, um, and I would say overall happiness. So we don't necessarily have to be sitting on the floor in what's called the lotus position. Uh, we don't have to be sitting on a pillow necessarily. We can be sitting in a chair, we can be lying down. Yeah. And there are different kinds of styles of meditation and the body position is not critical. But what about people that say, well, I tried meditation, but I actually fell asleep. Are they doing anything wrong? I remember you brought that up. Okay, no, and that happens. So especially if you're doing a lying down position, sometimes I'll lead classes where I'll have everyone lying down and I'll make sure that your joints are all relaxed and you're in that perfect position for circulation to be flowing. And naturally, if someone's maybe not been getting a lot of sleep or they're exerting a lot of energy and thinking and doing so much, that that moment that they lie down, their body is like, let me just fall asleep and rest. So while I'm trying to guide them through a meditation and I'm hoping their mind stays awake and alert, it's not always going to in the beginning because I personally, from my perspective, find that many people are burnt out and not giving themselves enough time to restore their energy, to allow their body to heal so when they have a chance to relax and go into a peaceful state, the brain and everything just wants to sleep and, and totally go out. And that's okay. So the idea is if you continue to practice, it'll get easier and you'll see the improvements and your ability to stay focused and awake. Um, will be a little bit longer, a little bit longer over time. Let's talk about different uh, styles of okay. yoga. We just have <clears throat> just a few minutes before we get to the break, but we mentioned transcendental meditation. That's a particular practice. There are other practices, and the reason I'm bringing yes. that one up is because that was developed by the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi back in about the 1960s, roughly. And in the 60s and 70s, it became a big sensation. The Beatles went over to see the the uh, Maharishi, I think the Beach Boys as well, and so everybody was picking up on that trend. But at the same time, we also had the Hare Krishna movement developing at the same time, and people were conflating the two, and that was maybe not necessarily a fair way to look at, at either one of those, but uh, so the impression was for a lot of people that TM is sort of a gateway to Hare Krishna Eastern religious cults. Yes, religious practice. Of exactly. Some sort. I, yes, and I've gotten that as well. Um, when I teach, I try to remove all of that 
the religion or any belief systems out of it and make it a bit more practical. However, you can, if you have a religion or a belief system, you can surely create a meditation based upon that. And if you choose to do meditation, no, it does not have to be attached. They're two separate things, but sometimes they get mixed in together. There's so many ways to meditate. You can count one, two, three, all the way up to 10, and then 10, nine, eight, seven, all the way back down to one, and continue to repeat that, that can be your focal point. That is a meditation. So it's for the individual, it's up to them to find and search the different styles and see what works, and make, make sure that it feels good to you. If you do have beliefs in certain, um, maybe a certain religious practice, you can use prayer or whatever you want to um, help your mind find that peace and be in the present moment. So just to reiterate and clarify, this is not a religious practice or does not uh, connote, um, I guess, affiliation with any particular Eastern religion. Anyone can meditate. Mm -hmm. Can Christians and Jews and people of other faiths who are devout in their faiths, can they also meditate? They sure can. And you can, oh, it's just remember, it's training the mind to focus on something in the present moment. We can, I love moving meditations. So when I'm walking, I'll kind of just keep myself in the moment by looking at the plants around me really being present with what's right in front of me or I'll come back to my breath. Very simple techniques and they have great benefit. All right, so as we talk about uh, meditation, when we get into meditation, we're trying to find that state of mind where relaxation occurs and calming mm -hmm. of the nerves and the inner peace. As we go into the break, we have about a minute. Um, if people find that state, how do they utilize that to carry on after the meditation session is over? Again, we only have less than a minute now. Okay, so essentially the benefits of what you're saying, I think if I'm going to clarify upon that, is sometimes the benefits actually arrive after your meditation. You might not feel the peace of mind during the meditation. It might come later. And it's more, it's, it's like if I eat healthy once a month versus eating healthy every day, I'm going to see the results when I eat healthy every day. So it's the same with meditation. If I'm just doing meditation once a month, is that going to bring me peace for the whole month? It, you know, not likely because of what it's doing to creating new neural pathways and all these things in your mind and also we're constantly being bombarded with stressors every single day and sometimes new triggers that we've never experienced before. So keeping the practice is important. It's part of it. And on that note, we do have to go to the break. So stay tuned. When we come back from the break, we'll talk about whether meditation is actually at odds with our modern contemporary culture. Stay with us. Get involved. Become a leader in the well-being of our nation, actively lending your voice and energy to promote wellness. Be the voice for public education and health education in schools, community organizations, hospitals, and clinics. You can become part of this exciting field with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, and my guest today is Megan McRae. Megan, when we went to the break, we said we were going to explore uh, the issue of whether meditation is at direct odds with our contemporary culture. And I would suggest, at least to start, that it is, because our modern culture seems to be full of activities and connectivity and um, stress and everything from commuting and traffic and road rage to staying connected on social media and making sure that we're keeping up with the Joneses in that way and texting and emailing and following the internet and so forth. So uh, how does one transition from the hectic pace of life into meditation and deal with this whole concept of instant gratification versus looking inward? God, you know, it's really funny is I found my, listening to all of that, I found myself going like, oh. <laughs> You, got you caught can up in the feel swirl. it, you know, it's like it's so draining. And that's exactly why 
people, something like meditation or any sort of practice that allows us to go inward, to decompress from the external stimuli is amazing because the feeling we get, I think sometimes we're just desensitized and don't realize how overwhelming it is, but we can surely, we know we're in a more overwhelmed state when we're feeling that worst case scenario mode. We're thinking of like what could go wrong versus positive solutions. I'm thinking about all the negative things about someone and myself versus what's going well and feeling good, feeling like things are coherent and in harmony. When I'm feeling the opposites, then that's my sign that I'm overwhelmed and had enough of that external stimuli. I'm too much in the conscious external and it's time to take a break. So your 10, 15 minutes, maybe starting out, as we said earlier, three minutes of meditation, whatever it is, is our intro and our, um, like our checkout, our break time to give our mind a break, our conscious mind a break, to go within in the internal subconscious where all our habits and behaviors are swimming, which seems a little like, oh, what does that mean? It's just about focusing more on us versus all the zillions of things outside of us. And that in itself can feel so much better <laughs> than woo, the, the, all the social media, all the television. I mean, it's really a lot, yeah. Do you have trouble getting people to disconnect from that hyperactive world? That's it. So at first, what I'll get is a resistance, like someone may want to come and work with me, but they'll tell me, you know, there's no way I can't calm my mind. I'm really sorry. Like, I want to try this. So there's like half, half in, half out. Like, I, I'll try this, but I'm telling you it's going to fail. No one can calm my mind. And I love a challenge. I'm like, okay, bring it. Let's do this. And <laughs> so, so we end up sitting down, and usually I'll guide someone through a state into a state of relaxation by maybe relaxing all the muscles, the physical body first. And then I'll give them something to focus on. And I won't put any pressure on the person because usually when we're in a state of feeling overwhelmed, we're already putting so much pressure on ourselves to meet deadlines, to live up to this person's expectations, to live up to our own expectations. We're judging and, and so harsh on ourselves. So with meditation, it's like, no, this isn't about being harsh. It's not about following another rule or doing, being right or wrong anymore. It's just about being. So I'm going to give you this focal point, but if your mind drifts off to your worries again, that's okay. Notice what your worries are. If your mind drifts off to a sound or a noise, okay, notice that. No big deal. And then just come back to the focal point. So there's no, um, there's no punishment. It's not a punishment and reward system. It's not about right or wrong. These are all, um, all of that way of thinking creates a lot of dis-ease and a lot of unpleasant emotion. So I do everything in my power to help someone come into a state of feeling at ease and so that we can start to culminate more of the pleasant emotions. You know, it's interesting you bring up the concept of dis-ease or disease. Most mm -hmm. people think of disease as a medical problem involving mm -hmm. bacteria or viruses and that kind of thing. But really it starts with lack of ease and that can be stress as well. It could be lack of mental yes. ease. Yes, and then over time, what happens when we're in a state of stress and dis-ease, and if my brain is now kind of in this state of disorder because I'm just hyper aware, I'm maybe going into that fight or flight mode too often, or I'm just super hyper vigilant, oh, the paralysis by analysis mode, um, constantly analyzing my external environment, and if I get into the state of feeling overwhelmed or a state of disorder, what kind of messages are sent to my central nervous system? What kind of messages are sent to my physiological system? They're not the best. They're not coherent. They're not pleasant. Um, and so something like meditation, that's, it's bringing ourselves out of this state of disorder, helping us come into a more coherent, pleasant state, not just emotionally, but that will in turn impact the physical body too. And it seems to me that we're actually now talking about transitioning into a value system because 
we have to have core values in order to live a balanced and stable life. And one of the problems, again, with our modern culture is materialism. And there was a bumper sticker about 15 years or so ago that said something like, he who dies with the most toys wins. Completely materialistic. And we know that we, we do live in a capitalist, consumer-based economy, and many of our jobs depend on selling items and goods and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, we have to get beyond that materialism, and we need to start thinking about things that really matter like patience and other virtues. Okay, so I like where you're going with this. I always like to look at both sides here, where there's that philosophy, and then I had a funny thought as you were talking, um, which means I wasn't being totally present, right? Because <laughs> I'm thinking while you're talking. <laughs> you have that active yeah, mind. I have an active mind. But I thought, oh gosh, well, hey, if you want to have a lot of toys, that's your choice, right? We live in a material world. We have bodies. That's matter. Okay, can't mm -hmm. avoid that. Let's accept it. Don't you want to enjoy your toys a lot longer? Do you, if you're going to acquire these things and that's a part of your choice in life, you'll get to experience them a lot longer if you take better care of this material thing right here, our body, our mind, our brain. So it's just shifting the perspective a bit. We can still choose whatever we want to choose, but it's having, finding that, um, switching on the light switch. So some people may need the, um, to hear, yeah, I don't have to focus so much on the material world anymore. But some people are like, hey, I want to. This is important for me. And so how can I, I or anyone who's kind of in a position like myself, flip on the switch and ignite the passion that it takes to be disciplined enough and committed enough to take care of ourselves? Are we really talking about finding balance and moderation in our lives? Because we can't completely disconnect from the modern world. That's obvious. Exactly. Our jobs depend upon it. Yeah. But do we need to find that balance so that we're not always on the go? Yeah, it's, and I didn't say this. It was something I read in a book. The finding a balance of exerting energy and the, or the art of doing versus not doing. Um, if I'm going to exert a certain amount of energy, maybe I like to work out, uh, there should be a healthy level of not doing, restoring my energy. So I can't operate on an empty battery all the time or else I'm gonna hit a wall. My moods are gonna go you know, off the charts and I'll have very little mastery over my emotional reactions. So something like meditation or having something that allows us to restore our energy and calm our mind, also helps us to have more mastery over our emotional reactions, which in turn I think is one of the most amazing benefits and outcomes I found through this practice is feeling like my emotions don't get the best of me as much anymore. Sometimes they do. When a new situation comes, usually it happens when I'm feeling depleted and haven't been taking the best care of myself. And that's when I know, like, okay, I'm not as in control time to get my, my own personal practice on point again. Let's talk about focusing, focused attention, or finding a focal point. I think we brought this up a few mm -hmm. times already. Yeah. Let's uh, talk about that a little bit more. What does it mean to find a focal point in the process of meditating? And then how does that lead to what's called mindfulness? What is mindfulness and how does the focal point or focusing or focused attention lead to mindfulness? Excellent. Okay, well, they're kind of that. There's two different things we have going on. So, mindfulness. If we, if I think of the definition, and I hope I'm saying it right, uh, being accepting and aware of, or first aware of, and then accepting of our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings, and our physical sensations. So it's just noticing that can be the focal point. Our it's every aspect of your being. Meditation, training the mind to focus on one thing. A mindfulness technique that's also a meditation may be simply um, one that I've offered is saying, I know that I am breathing in as I'm breathing in. I know that I am breathing out as I'm breathing out. And I'll kind of, I'll smile as I breathe in and relax my face as I breathe out. And you just stay with that. So that's the focal point and you're just simply focusing on the breath, moving in and moving out. Another mindfulness technique is being aware of and accepting of the external environment. So if I'm walking and I'm looking at the plants, things like that. 
or if I'm sitting and I'm noticing like, okay, my brain is going in a million directions, that's okay. What directions is it going in? Um, but there are other meditations where maybe someone simply focuses on looking at a candle flame and your focal point is just that candle flame and every time your mind wanders off to something else, you notice and you bring it back to the candle flame. So it's hopefully that answers your question of mm -hmm. how that goes together and you can come up with, you can have a, an instructor help you find a focal point if you want or you can do research online or hopefully based on the information I'm giving today, you can come up with something that feels good to you, you know? As we talk about mindfulness, is it possible for mindfulness to lead to greater compassion? Mm -hmm. Can we find compassion within mindfulness? In other words, if we're going through life holding grudges or we're holding up our guard, um, keeping our guard up so that right. uh, we're not letting anybody get close to us, is yes. that a problem? We just have a couple minutes left. Okay, so compassion is being more sympathetic and concerned when someone is suffering, right? Um, I'm going to be less compassionate and concerned about someone else's suffering if I'm suffering. <laughs> it's going to be harder for me if my cup spilleth over with really, um, I'll use the word toxic, but um, hurtful type energy if I'm in a lot of pain. So if I can sort through my own pain and my own wounds and my own stuff, that opens me up to be more compassionate for others who are in a state of suffering and or in any sort of state of pain. Yes, I believe so. We've just about run out of time. Okay. I'll give you about 15 seconds here at the end. In 15 seconds or less, um, if you're going to advise somebody to start with meditation, what's the first thing they should do? Okay, so I advise starting with the breath, the one that I gave earlier, sitting down, finding a comfortable position, Back is nice and relaxed. You can lean back in a chair. Feet are planted. Uncross your feet. Just get everything really comfortable. Hands, face, close your eyes. And all you have to do is sit there as you're breathing in. I know that I am breathing in. I know that I'm breathing out as you exhale. It's actually, uh, I did not come up with this technique. It's one that I was taught. Um, and do that for five to seven breaths. Just and that. unfortunately, because of television, I have to cut you off. Okay, so it's, it's kind of stressful with this technology. But I want to thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure. Our pleasure. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Talking Points. Be sure to join us again soon for another episode. Until then, have a nice day. I'm Dave Kelly.